I'll start uh, giving an overview of the immune epitope database as an analysis resource. So um, we typically have done this in two days, one day database, other day prediction tools, but then we found that typically we run out of time in the prediction tools, so we've kind of carried this over to the first day now. I do want to uh, point out again, as has been said before though, um, tools should really be the second choice. Uh, if you're looking for an epitope in an antigen, it's, uh, if you can actually find it published, it's always going to be better uh, of somebody who has actually found an immune response rather than predicting it. It's definitely worth always first looking through the database itself. So, but again, now I'm going to be talking about the analysis resource because obviously not everything is known, not for everything is the experimental data available. Um, I'll start by saying who did this, and some of the people are in this room, Udita and uh, Sinu, uh, sitting in the back, and are going to give uh, some of the talks tomorrow. Uh, Julia is also going to be here, um, and we are collaborating closely with a uh, team in Denmark, and uh, Thomas is also here as well. So a bunch of people here that you can bother uh, with all your questions, then this is the overall uh, IDB team, and this is uh, Lidos who are doing the um, uh, database maintenance. So um, <coughs> there's two main classes of tools in the IDB that we're referring to. One is the prediction tools, the other one is the analysis tools. So prediction tools are really about uh, the algorithms that we have trained based on data that we have in the IADB um, that are then used to learn rules of immune recognition that we can use to scan antigens that have not been studied and predict new epitopes. So examples of those are the MHC class one and class two binding tools, MHC class one processing and immunogenicity predictions, B cell epitope predictions. And then in contrast to that, there are the epitope analysis tools. And analysis tools are uh, those where essentially you have a set of epitopes and you want to learn additional features of them. So examples of those are the conservancy analysis, population coverage analysis, and cluster analysis. <coughs> the prediction tools are what most people use on the website. So I'll talk in some more detail about that and explain somewhat generically uh, what machine learning is uh, because these prediction tools are machine learning methods. So what we have in the case of MHC class one binding is this kind of experimental data. You have some kind of system where you measure binding of a purified peptide to an MHC molecule. And the kind of data you're getting out from that is, is tables of peptide sequences and the measured affinities. Very frequently, the kind of data we have is IC50 values or EC50 values where you have a competitive binding assay in which you're measuring inhibition of binding of a known high affinity reference ligands and you're asking at what concentration uh, of the peptide of interest here do you outcompete 50% of your reference ligands. And, and if this perf assay is performed under the right conditions, uh, then IC50 value is proportional to the binding free energy and uh, a low bi IC50 value means it's high affinity. So low IC50 value means you have to have a low concentration of this peptide to outcompete your own reference ligand. So from this data, um, sure. Sorry? That depends on the assay. So um, uh, this this is not something we normally capture. So um, okay, now it's doing weird things. Um, so, so that's, that's it really, uh, we can't say that. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, okay, so you can say, well, if I have these binding assays, then the problem is solved. I can just go through this uh, given set of antigens and, and just measure the binding affinity of every possible peptide. But that obviously would be quite a lot of money and time you'd have to spend on measuring these binding assays. Uh, so instead, what we want to do is learn from these measurement values and uh, in order, uh, based on these rules that we can learn from them, uh, predict binding of new peptides. And what we do for that is a process called machine learning and that essentially says, can we find some kind of function uh, from uh, selection uh, in, in a functional space where that function will, given, given the sequence, will give an approximate outcome of the measured affinity. And there's many, many different approaches that do this. And they differ by uh, like in neural networks, support vector machines, hidden Markov models, linear programming, etc. And ultimately, uh, they all are the same, um, they all follow the same concepts, I mean, they do this, but what they differ in is like, what is the functional space they consider? 
uh, or what, is, what do they mean by find? And uh, how do they evaluate if a prediction is, approximate, uh, is a good enough approximation of the measured affinity? So I'll talk about, as an example, um, an easy to understand machine learning method, uh, which is based on, on, on uh, scoring matrices. So you can imagine that uh, given a set of peptides, um, you can encapsulate the binding specificity of the molecule for peptides of this length using a scoring matrix. And essentially what we want this matrix to do is given a peptide sequence, we look up the values in this matrix for the sequence. So we start with a phenylalanine, glutamine, glutamine, proline, etc. You take these values, you sum them up, you add an offset value, and then that should be approximate to your measured log IC50 value. So essentially this is a, a, um, that process of identifying which matrix will minimize the distance between these predicted values and the measured values um, is a machine learning approach. So essentially you're varying the values of your matrix until you're approximately getting out these measured values here and then you believe because it works for many of the examples that you put in that it'll work uh, for additional um, peptides that you haven't measured. In this case, this is essentially represents the function which will translate any given peptide sequence into a predicted affinity value. So, as I said, there's many methods out there and still every few months or so I, I get several papers to review with new MHC binding prediction methods. And they're interesting. I think every, um, well, every new method somebody thinks, okay, this is going to solve MHC binding predictions and then I get like whatever. And, and Artificial ant colony prediction paper was, I think, the most funny one. So, um, I have here, I think. Um, okay. So, in order to compare these, we must find a way of, of um, being able to say quantitatively which method works better than the other one. And so, actually, uh, when I started my postdoc in Alex Lab in 2004, one of the main reasons I went there, this is before the IADB was uh, uh, founded was that Alex had this amazing uh, set of data and he combined it with CERN boost data. So uh, essentially we combined a, a total of like uh, 48 MHC alleles, 88 data sets, 48,000 IC50 values. So that was by far the largest data set people had ever uh, put together. And uh, in each of these sets now, uh, we have a set of peptides and measured IC50 values. And we were asking of the published methods that are out there, how well do they perform? How well can they predict these binding values. And so what we did is we went to the web servers that were out at the time and asked each of them essentially predict the values for the peptides in the data set. And then as a first, you can just plot here. This is the SIFPIDE approach, uh, which gives out a, a prediction score. And then we can plot that against the affinity values. And you see there's a clear trend um, that for higher scores in SIFPIDE, we tend to have lower IC50 values as you'd expect. Another, and Cephidi and BIMIS are two of the most uh, uh, pioneering prediction methods in the field. And you see that they both do work. Um, and in this case, BIMIS actually works better than Cephidi, which is not so much of a surprise. Cephidi is actually meant specifically to predict eluded ligands, not really binding affinities, versus BIMIS does binding affinities. And you can say, well, you could take the, the R squared value uh, as a measure. But actually, the other thing about the R squared value is then you're assuming that the score you're getting from the prediction methods actually is. Uh, really a, a reflection of binding affinity. And for CIFPIDE, it's definitely not or of um, overlap with known motifs. So rather than uh, assuming that these are exactly meant to be IC50 values on the prediction scale, and actually BIMIS predicts half-life of binding, um, we used uh, ROC curves, and we're using them throughout, and we're using them uh, uh, tomorrow. We're going to talk some more about outcomes of these. So I want to briefly explain these. So commonly, what we want to identify is peptides that bind with an IC50 value less than 500 nanomolar. Because we've so shown in several studies that that tends to be the threshold uh, at which most known T cell epitopes bind. So essentially, we want to distinguish peptides down here that has an IC50 value less than 500 nanomolar from those up here that have one that is greater. And we can say, okay, given the score, we can say, okay, the guys. The prediction says everything above 15 here, say, is, is good, and everything less than 15 is bad. And then we can say, okay, um, these are then true positive predictions because the score prediction is good and the, the affinity is less than 500 nanomolar. 
which are false positive because the score is high and the um, quality is, is uh, uh, finding affinity is worse. And uh, that gives you one, essentially at that, that, that threshold, we can essentially calculate these four rates and calculate things like accuracy or sensitivity or specificity. But that, then you have to arbitrarily pick a score and different methods recommend different scores and they are benchmarked on different things. So to avoid having to do that, all we're asking for is that um, the prediction method gives some kind of quantitative scale and then we can vary these scores from start to end. Let each of the uh, cutoffs calculate the true positives and false positives rates and then you're getting a plot like this. This is an ROC curve. And essentially what you want your ROC curve to be, if it's perfect, you go up and you find all your true positives and uh, then it'll uh, start giving you false, false positive predictions. So that uh, the highest scores would all be your actual binaries. So in this case, you see uh, the predictions of Swift Piety and uh, BIMAS, and we compare them to this graph, and BIMAS performs better with an AUC value of 0 0.92 uh, and Swift Piety at 0 0.871. So um, these are actually, all of them are very good predictions. Uh, a random prediction would be here uh, and have an AUC value of 0.5. So uh, as a, uh, so the, 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 you can actually um, translate what an AUC value is and if you, it's, you can show that it's actually the probability of given two peptides uh, that you'll, uh, that you, if you then take the two scores, that the one with the better score is also gonna be the better binary. So um, using this measure, uh, we went through and compared all these different uh, external prediction approaches on, on the data sets that we had available and what became really clear is um, that this is not really a fair comparison. Because in that we are comparing two things. We're comparing how good is the method that's on that server, but we are also comparing, well, how much data did they have, have available to train it? We saw that in our own hands. Uh, it doesn't matter how smart your algorithm is if you have the most fancy neural network. If you don't have data to train it with, it's not gonna perform well. So, while this uh, was interesting in terms of it gave a reflection of how good the current web servers out there were in terms of predicting, uh, we were more interested uh, to learn what kind of methods work better. And we did that by using internal uh, cross-validation. So for cross-validation, that's a term that's gonna come up a bunch tomorrow. Uh, what we do is we take a whole data set, we leave out something like a fifth of the data, and then we use the rest to train a prediction method. And then we take the leftover part and uh, predict these left out ones to see how well do they work. And then we can do this five times, meaning for every peptide in the original data set, we have a prediction made by a predictor that didn't have that peptide as part of its training. And uh, we can measure then the performance of the training method on this. And we can do this with different training approaches and um, then compare how well do the different approaches uh, uh, perform. And in upcoming talks, we'll show results of that. So again, and this is gonna be <laughs> constant, so it, this is like kind of the same like the presentation I get at the beginning of today. Uh, I'm giving you an overview here and tomorrow we're gonna dive into the details. So um, uh, talking briefly, giving an overview of the prediction tools available in the IADB, we have B-cell epitope prediction. And the main approaches we have are, we have implemented a number of tools that have been described in the literature like hydrophilicity predictions, uh, et cetera, that are using amino acid scales those were the first predictions that noticed that there was an overlap of things that are rep recognized as B cells and certain um, amino acid properties. Um, so I think they're the main contribution that we did was just to put, really put them all side by side on one page and re-implementing the algorithms, which many of them were not available in any computational um, implementation. And then we do have some machine learning predictions and structure-based approaches. Um, and um, yeah, in terms of breadth, those cover all organisms. So we do not think that there's a difference in the kind of epitopes recognized fundamentally or, or predictably between an, a mouse or a human. Um, there might very well be some, but at least the rules aren't well enough to understood to really tease those things apart. So the same tools would be apl applicable for any kind of host you're looking for. In general, the accuracy tends to be poor. Um, the AUC values I showed you for, for class one binding predictions are above 0.9 uh, versus for, for um, B cell epitope predictions, they are at 0.6 to 0.7. So this is clearly above random, it's better than not doing anything at all, but it's not as reliable. You cannot uh, completely uh, uh, 
build your uh, research program on relying completely on the predictions, definitely. The other problem is that the evaluation is kind of tricky. Um, that's because the epitope mapping in the, in the cases of these tests is trickier. Uh, and definitely for, for discontinuous epitopes, it's sometimes hard to decide what residues are actually part of an epitope, which ones are not. For class one binding, that's the example I showed you, um, there's definitely huge differences, and we know it, that we have to have different predictions for every different species because you have MHC diversity and different MHC molecules for different organisms are fundamentally different. So we're covering humans uh, very well at this point with 83 different alleles for which we have direct measurements for. Uh, then we have non-human primates, quite a lot of data for chimpanzees and macaques, and non-primates such as pigs, rats, mouse, and cow, uh, which are also reasonably well covered at this point. There's very high performance highest in comparison to class two and antibody res uh, responses. And the, essentially, as I showed you, already the biomass and cephidi predictions were very good. So there are continuously improvements being made, but to some extent, MHC class one binding uh, is, is, is uh, yeah, to some extent it's a solved problem. So we, we at, at this point at a level of prediction quality um, where there isn't that much room upward. Um, in contrast, MHC class two binding the breadth is definitely lower. Um, we have 24 human allele covers uh, and, and uh, uh, one, three alleles for, uh, uh, for mice, uh, but that not, not so much in terms of um, uh, non-human primates. The accuracy is lower in comparison to class one, but higher than uh, what's available for antibodies. Um, and there's definitely the biggest improvements have been made recently. Um, yeah, sub uh, yeah. So I also should, should mention that both for class one and class two, uh, we have these pan MHC uh, methods available, which extrapolate from the alleles that are characterized to other alleles. So to, to in that extent, we are actually covering not just 24 human class two alleles, and not just 83 class one, but to some extent with those methods, we're covering the entirety of MHC alleles out there. Um, the next set of tools are MHC class one processing tools. So the peptides that end up pro processed and presented on the cell uh, are not only capable of binding to MHC, but they must be able to uh, be generated to proteasomal cleavage and be transported from the cytosol into the ER by TAP. So <coughs> the first set of predictors we have actually <coughs> separately <coughs> model these steps of proteasomal cleavage and TAP transport uh, using independent data sets characterizing each of these processes. And then we just put them together add the MHC binding predictions in, and they're done. The second set of predictors uses eluted peptides. So if eluted peptides, that means you have an experiment where you have uh, peptides isolated from the outside of a cell that were naturally processed and presented, meaning they have undergone these processes. And then these predictors um, essentially just see the end result, uh, see the source sequence, and try from that then to infer uh, could this peptide have been um, eluded. In terms of breadth, we only have this available and only validated for humans. And I know, I mean, I did one study uh, studying uh, marine tap preferences, and they're definitely different. So I would absolutely caution using these tools to make predictions for anything but um, human class one epitopes. Uh, one of the things that we noted as uh, these, these predictions work quite well, distinguishing random peptides uh, from epitopes, but when we combine them with MHC binding predictions, the improvement actually isn't that big. And one of the reasons for that is co-evolution. <laughs> Essentially, MHC molecules have evolved to have C-terminal binding preferences uh, that tend to like things that come out of TAP and the proteasome. So ultimately, if you predict MHC binding well, quite often, you're also covering the processing quite well. So the improvement is not as big as you would think when you look how well they perform uh, com uh, dis distinguishing epitopes from random peptides. We still haven't performed a large scale validation of how exactly, uh, the, how large exactly the improvement is. But I think, especially with some of the data coming out of uh, Willy Hildebrand's lab, who we are collaborating with, uh, enable us to do some quite nice evaluations. Um, epitope analysis tools. So that's the second set of tools I mentioned, uh, where essentially the goal is not so much to predict a new epitope, but to analyze and add value to existing epitope data sets. And I'll give uh, a, an example, which is um, at this point a, a classic, I guess, because it's from 2009, uh, but it's still very neat and I think was, was a very nice demonstration of what you could do with the IBD. So as you remember, 
in spring 2009, there was this outbreak of the pandemic uh, swine origin influenza virus. And um, that was first circulating in Mexico and people were dying and to, like they estimated death rates of 50% originally, which is actually an interesting, if you read up on the epidemiological data, they must have gotten something wrong because as you know, it didn't end up being that bad. Uh, in spring 2009, sequences became available and we were asking, uh, can we use the IADB to say something about the sequences? Can we say something about what are the immune responses gonna be like uh, for this uh, newly arising strain? And how different are they from what we're expecting when we have a newly arising seasonal flu strain? So the way we did this is we queried the IADB for all epitopes that are known from influenza A virus. And then we also looked what kind of seasonal strains have there been circulating in the last 20 years? And we said, well, if there is a peptide that is known to be capable of being recognized from influenza A, and there was a strain circulating in the last 20 years that contained that epitope, then there should be some uh, immunity uh, for in, in the natural population based on that exposure to this uh, sp specific epitope. Um, and that should then lead to a pre-existing immune response against these epitopes uh, and presumably cross-reactive with what's found in the 2009 strain. So, and then when we look at those, we ask, yeah, are they conserved uh, in the seasonal, uh, um, yeah, how much, many of these kinds of epitopes are conserved in seasonal strain versus pandemic? So, uh, and this is the old IDB 2.0 data size uh, page, which is appropriate only because this was done in 2009 and this is the actual data that we got in 2009. So the query is still uh, conceptually very similar here. That's why I left it like it is. Where you can say the source organism is influenza and the responses you look for are B cell responses and, and in humans. And when you query for that, you get a, a, an output that looks somewhat different here, but you still have the export of Excel. So you can export your epitopes just the, the same way you would do it in the current system. Once you have these epitopes, you put them in one of these uh, analysis tools. So in this case, this is the conservancy analysis tool. So these are now the epitopes from influenza virus um, that are, uh, <coughs> have been experimentally characterized. And we add in here uh, the new 2009 pandemic viral sequences and we ask, are these guys conserved in the pandemic strains? Um, and this is the kind of output of from the conservancy tool and I'll explain it more tomorrow. Um, but essentially you see that some peptides are completely not found ever um, in any of the uh, strains versus other peptides are. And uh, looking at this data then we can summarize it and say okay, repeating this analysis for both the 2009 strain and the two th uh, seasonal uh, 2008 strain, you can say for B cell epitopes actually um, there was significantly less uh, conservation of previously circulating epitopes um, in the uh, pandemic strain compared to previously circulating epitopes to the, uh, to the 2008 um, strain. And uh, we did this systematically and this is very, uh, definitely very much significant. And that matched what people were saying at the time. So the reason that why there was so much concern about the outbreak was when people were doing neutralization assays and comparing do Sera from people kill this 2009 virus, they did not. And so in that sense, it's reflected based on having quite a, a lot less of, of, of conserved antibody binding targets uh, compared to a, a new seasonal strain. Now, if you look on the other hand at the T cell side of things, uh, you do actually find that there's a substantial over conservation or a substantial similar, a similar number of epitopes found um, in the 2009 strain. There is, it's somewhat less than what's in the 2008 strain, but it's not as drastic as for B cell epitopes. And when you look actually at the, where do these epitopes come from, that does make sense. Because many of the targets of T cell responses in influenza are not from the uh, surface antigens, which were the ones that were changing the most in the pandemic strains. Many of them are from internal proteins. So based on that, we hypothesized that there should be significant pre-existing immunity against, uh, at the T cell level, against the 2009 strain. So we just made these peptides and asked, do we see reactivity towards them? We tested them in interfering gamma LE spots, and we do see, and we had here samples banked from 2000, uh, 2008, um, and so essentially we could ask in these samples from 2008, before the outbreak of the pandemic, before the outbreak of the seasonal, um, 
what's the level of reactivity we are seeing? And we are seeing essentially uh, uh, comparable reactivities for both the pandemic and the seasonal um, flu. And um, so that was uh, very nice. It was very hard to publish at first because everybody just wanted to see how bad influenza is going to get. And then people didn't die and then we could publish it, um, which was interesting. And there's right now has been a number of follow-up studies to this. It's actually really interesting how um, that these responses are actually predictive of uh, disease severity. So there was 2000, uh, uh, 14 nature medicine study where they showed specifically looking at the conserved epitopes uh, in the new strain, how, how they are uh, uh, taken before outbreak of, the, um, uh, outbreak of the pandemic from those individuals and then they tracked them, surveilled them and could show that it's correlated with disease severity. So um, based on these, uh, uh, the conclusions of this part are the conservancy tool predicted the pre-existing immunity exists in the general population at the T-cell, but less at the B-cell level. And we could experimentally measure T-cell responses that confirm that there's pre-existing memory responses against these swine origin influenza virus epitopes in a comparable magnitude to what is seen for seasonal influenza. So um, that's the example for the conservancy analysis tools. We have other analysis tools. And again, I'll explain to more tomorrow. Uh, but what they cover is the population coverage tool which is meant to extrapolate based on, for a set of peptides with known HLA restriction, can we project how, uh, what's the overall population uh, coverage of that set of peptides in terms of um, uh, coverage based on, yeah. Um, and the cluster analysis where we're looking for, if you have sets of epitopes derived from, say, different uh, isoforms of the same proteins or different lengths, uh, can we cluster them together and identify which ones actually are covering the same uh, sequence. So summarizing this uh, bit, the IDB prediction tools extrapolate from existing data to identify new candidate epitopes. And I showed you uh, the basic concept of machine learning, how we're generalizing from principles, obser uh, individual observations to more general patterns that can be then used to scan for new epitopes. And we're using ROC curves and AUC values. That's the, the curves I showed you to as a measured as a preferred metric for prediction performance because they're nicely comparable no matter what the scales are that different tools are using as outputs. And then we have IDB analysis tools that are help examine existing sets of epitopes and gain new knowledge. And there's no really performance metric there. They should work or not. I mean, if they don't work, there's a bug and we want to know, uh, but they should. And there's a, a broad area of applications. We're always surprised what some people, uh, creative uses people come up with and uh, excited about that. It's the end of my talk, and uh, yes. Excuse me, Dr. Peter. I have a question. Yeah. Performance of B cell epitope prediction is poor than T cell prediction. So how we can improve it further in case of B cell? OK, so um, they, they work better than random. We are just cautious in terms of how good they work. <laughs> um, so there's, um, I mean, uh, Julia is going to give some overviews tomorrow on how to use the B-cell epitope tools. Um, so we like to be realistic about what our tools perform. <laughs> Again, we are not a company, so we are not going to show you how to make vaccines in 24 hours. Um, yeah, so, so the, this is the, it's a realistic estimate of how well the predictions perform. I think they are still useful, and we have done through some several cases where they, they can be used. But it's uh, definitely I would caution towards. So, so say for, for MHC class one binding predictions, if you have a protein and ask me what are going to be the epitopes in there, I can say it's going to be these three, and I would bet. I would bet you beers that these are going to be the ones that are recognized. For B cell, I would not bet you beers. <laughs> Maybe one shot, and uh, <laughs> but then I'd have to get like I don't know. Uh, I, it's more like then you'd have to get uh, uh, if you have a choice of like uh, uh, if you have a hundred potential peptides. In the case of class one binding predictions, I can say okay, I can tell you three that are going to be covering with 95% certainty what the epitope is. For B cells, you might have to make 20 or, or so. So it's just uh, that because the prediction quality is lower, you'd have to have more shots on goal to make 